so here's the thing. What, what's up with, uh, with Marxism is, A, there's a lot in Marx's critique of capitalism that's actually right. And so that kind of gets you through the door once you start looking at the analysis. And then there's the prescription, which is toxic. But it's not obvious why it's toxic. In other words, it's a pretty good story that doesn't happen to function. And so people gravitate to it because the story is moderately compelling. It's not game theoretically functional or stable or viable, and it does descend into this kind of, you know, inevitable grave violence. And so we know that now historically. It's not just a theoretical issue. We've now seen enough of it to know that as a fact. But nonetheless, the fact that there are people telling the story to kids who don't yet know what to do with something that sounds like it might be true um, is, is very dangerous. If you don't mind, break it down as to why it goes bad. Well, I mean, it's sort of a tired critique, but I happen to think it's about right, which is that it just does not take account of what a human being is and what makes society function. <laughs> Spoken like a true fascist, biologically essentialist. <laughs> yeah, but no, I think that, is, I that think, wasn't very I, nice, Peterson. <laughs> I, think, I think I think that is well. I think it might be related back to. Okay, so let's go back to the idea that Marx had something to say. Okay, and we could clarify that a little bit. So here's a problem. This is the problem that that seems to emerge as the function of some really fundamental force that we don't quite understand, and that's this phenomena that I've been referring to as the Pareto distribution. Okay, so here, here's, the, here's the situation. If you look at any creative endeavor that human beings engage in, so that would be an endeavor where there's variability in individual production. It doesn't matter what it is. Here's what happens. People compete to produce whatever that is, and almost everybody produces zero. They lose completely. A small minority are a tiny bit successful, and a hyper minority are insanely successful and so the Pareto distribution for, and the Pareto distribution is is the what geometric graph representation of that phenomena and so here's how it manifests itself um, if you have 10,000 people a hundred of them have half the money so the rule is the square root of the number of people under consideration have half of whatever it is that's under consideration. So this works everywhere. So if you took 100 classical composers, 10 of them produce half the music that's played. And then if you take the, the 10 composers and you take 1,000 of their songs, 30 of those songs, which is the square root of 1,000, roughly speaking, are played 50% of the time. And so there's this underlying natural law which is, it's expressed as the Matthew principle, which is from a New Testament statement. The statement is, uh, to those who have everything, more will be given, and from those who have nothing, everything will be taken. It's a vicious statement, but it, it's actually, here's one of those places where it's actually empirically true. This happens everywhere. And so what Marx observed was that capital tended to accumulate in the hands of fewer and fewer people. And he said, that's a flaw of the capitalist system. That's wrong. It's not a flaw of the capitalist system. It is a feature of every single system of production that we know of, no matter who set it up and how it operates. And so then now we have a problem, because what happens is, as soon as you set up a domain of production, and you need to because you need things to be produced, then you instantly produce a competition, and the spoils go disproportionately to a tiny percentage of people. So then, the, so then well, so what? Well. So the rest of the people starve, or the system becomes unstable because everybody's mad. It's like, that's a big problem. Okay, so how do human beings fix that? Well, the first thing we did was diversify the number of productive games. And so you don't get to be NBA basketball star, but, you know, you can run a podcast. It's a completely different competitive landscape. So we can fractionate the, the, the production landscape, and then people who aren't successful in one domain might be successful in others. That's cre human creativity. We're really good at that. But the problem with that is you still get a positive correlation among the successful people. You know, so because you're so successful, for example, with your podcast and your YouTube videos, your connection network is insane, insanely powerful. Right? So you still have this tendency for what's useful and good to be, uh, what, distributed, let's call it inequitably. And it's, it's, it's got the power of a physical law. In fact, there are people, they call themselves econophysicists. No one knows that there's a field, econophysicists, econophysics. And they use the same mathematical equations that, that, that 
represent the propagation of molecules into a gas molecules into a vacuum to describe the manner in which money distributes itself in an economy. Okay, so Marx pointed to a fundamental issue. But he said, well, that's a fault with capitalism. It's like, no, it isn't. It's something way more pernicious than that. And it's, it's something like, well, when one good thing happens to you, it makes you a little more powerful and attractive. And so that fractionally increases the possibility that another good thing will happen to you. And then that spirals out of control. And you get people who have, well, they have all the money or they have all the podcast downloads. You're in that position. You know, what is it, 1.2 billion? Like, what the hell? But it's to those who have more, and it's not because there's something oppressive about you. It's because you, you rode the wave of the Pareto distribution and it, and it, it threw you way the, up, way the hell up into the stratosphere. And we don't know what to do about that. Like, should you be sharing your podcast views with the, with the oppressed and downtrodden? I mean, you've, well, you've got a few billion, you could spread the damn things around. It's not fair that you're the only one that's being listened to. You know, it's the same argument. And it's a compelling argument because why the hell should you have all that power? If you call it power, you could call it authority or competence. But isn't that a different argument? Because no one's asking anyone to download anything in specific. No one's no one's compelling anyone to download anything specific. You could download whatever you want. And well, if you put more effort and more time and more focus into your work, whatever it would be, whether it's a podcast or your YouTube videos or whatever, if people enjoy it, they gravitate towards it. And then over time it exponentially increases the amount of people that are exposed well, to it. Well, this is why I think that the, the, and this is the other problem with the Marxist perspective is that, and the postmodernists in particular, like they conflate power, competence, and authority unfairly. Now your point, it's sort of the point of free marketers. You're saying, well, look, all I'm doing is offering a product. I'm not compelling anyone. It's a quality product, or at least as far as the market is concerned, it is. If it turns out that everyone wants that, well, what's wrong with that? And I'm not disagreeing with that argument in the least, but, but it's, it, it, the problem is it doesn't, it doesn't fix the problem. Like the problem with money, let's say. The problem is, is that if you let a monetary system run, all the money ends up in the hands of a very few, of a very small number right. of people. And you're saying this is also with any sort of creative endeavor. Any, any creative endeavor, man. Now, what is wrong? Like, I think the the real issue would be to maximize potential output or maximize the amount of successful people. You'd have to figure out what's don't concentrate on what people are doing right. Concentrate on what people are doing wrong. Like, what why what are the people doing wrong that are failing? Whether in any creative well, that's, endeavor. Well, that's partly well, why we put to together, sorry, just give me one yeah, minute all. Sure. That's partly why we put together the future authoring program, because we were trying to figure out what made people successful. And one of the things that makes people successful is they specify a target and then aim at it. Right? Because if you're all over the place, well, we do know in a, in a relatively functional society like ours, we know what predicts success. IQ and conscientiousness are the biggest predictors of success. Now, there's a genetic lottery thing going on there that's kind of rough, but it does say that smart people who work hard are disproportionately likely to succeed. And then you might also say, well, you want to remove the impediments from people who have those capabilities so that they can move forward. And one, one of the predictors of success as well is to decide what your success is going to be and then work hard in that direction. And that actually works. So I think that is a, a very useful thing to do. And that's, well, like I said, that's partly why we've been working in that direction. So... But it, there's other problems that it doesn't still, still doesn't solve. Like one of them is, if you don't have any money, it's really hard to get some. Like once mm. you have some, it's not so hard to get some more. But, right. but if you're at zero, Jesus, man, you're in this, you're in the reverse situation. Mm. You're poor. You don't have anything. No one wants to talk to you. You can't get out of it because you're too poor to get out of it. You know, you're penalized by the economic system because you can't even afford to start playing the game. You're stuck at zero. You're stuck at zero. And you can't get out. And the revolutionary types, you know, they go to the people who are stuck at zero and they say, hey, you're stuck at zero. Why don't you burn the whole goddamn thing to the ground? Right. Because maybe in the next iteration, you won't be stuck at zero. And for young men, that's a hell of a call. Right. Because they're already let's call them expendable biologically and that makes them more adventurous and risk-taking right. if someone says and maybe that's why they wear the Che Guevara t-shirt it's mm -hmm. like hey I'm stuck at zero well I'd rather be with the romantic who's burning the whole thing to the ground than to just you know to stay locked in my immobile position